of the session is Rajasthan's Book of Numbers and it's presented by the Rajasthan Patrika and it'll be introduced by Marcus Du Sotoy. So before, uh, without further delay, Marcus, it's on to you. Oh, thank you very much all for coming. Um, my name is Marcus de Soto. I am a professor of mathematics, uh, but Barnaby Rogerson here is a publisher and a writer of, uh, well, histories of the Crusades and um, a biography of the prophet. Uh, so what on earth has got you into writing a book about numbers? Well, first of all, I must apologize, especially to Marcus. You shouldn't be sitting on the same bench as me. Uh, my wife, um, when she advise people going to listen to me in, in London, said the first thing you should know is that there's no maths in this book at all. It, it's written by someone with no understanding of numbers, and we've lived together for 25 years. She, she knows that now. And the other thing, um, the other apology about this book is I'm talking to Indians about sacred numerology. So it's like a, uh, it's like a Bateman car cartoon, the man who dared to address an Indian audience about sacred numbers. It's quite absurd. And the third apology, is that anybody can make this book. Um, I, over a lifetime of reading and working as a publisher, whenever I saw something to do with um, a numerical uh, quantity, would just pop it into a box. And the only thing about it, it took about 30 years, and after 30 years, it sort of bounced out into a book. Not a book that any publisher wanted. Um, I made my own very fat Christmas card about four years ago, and sent it to 365 friends wanting some sort of response back. And I got, by coincidence, but a, a marvelous coincidence, it explains something about writers. Andrew Wilson and Artemis Cooper were one of the only two people who replied. And the nature of a writer is to write, and people need to be um, reminded about that. But this, um, this book, as I've said, is not uh, about maths. It's really about number as a sort of shape, possibly as an adjective of power and responsibility, possibly as an adverb of divine love and about what numbers mean completely outside of the mathematician's brain. And Marcus is, like Mary Beard, is one of the greatest things about England today, a true democrat and a true teacher. And for God's sake, don't be encouraged by the Jaipur festival of going to England. You've got <laughs> the best of England here already. Um, but to return to my question, um, I, as a young man, in order to become a writer, practiced by writing guidebooks. And I went to Istanbul and Cyprus and Morocco and did guidebooks. And I managed to persuade artists to work virtually for free illustrating these books. And I got hold of my uh, stepmother's mother, an amazing woman who had 500 male lovers that she could remember. Rather the opposite of what we were hearing yesterday in the tent. And to cap it all, the only man she loved out of this 500 was a Muslim gentleman who turned out to be, uh, later on, or is now considered to be a bit of a Sufi saint in Scotland. And he never slept with her. And so there's an extraordinary twist to that tale yesterday about a proper Muslim man making this extraordinary beautiful woman who's age 80 when she started to um, help me illustrate this book. And I can remember her obsessively. It was a, a room like this, not as magnificent as this, but it was in Cyprus with a great dome, and she was obsessively um, illustrating it and also counting out um, the, the shapes in the domes, the numbers. And I said, you know, um, Angela, what's, what's all this about? Um, she said, I'm just trying to see what people might be telling me. And I got so excited as a historian that there was some embedded print of message in there, and she was, um, out of her own sort of Islamic tradition, trying to see if there was some Bektashi, or Mevlevi message in the, in the construction of the room, or, or possibly even Jewish. And, and it's that sort of um, imagery that drew it to me. Another guidebook experience, again as a young man, stomping around, walking a little bit too fast, pockets, as I still got them, full of notebooks and pens, was um, having a trip to find this old Roman bath, which is still working, um, on the edge of the frontier of Tunisia and Algeria. And so I ended up getting a guide, this wonderful old Tunisian shepherd who was illiterate, but thought I needed instruction and help. And so he would hold up his right hand, instructing me about Islam, going through the five pillars of Islam, and then saying, this is our good hand, the left hand is our bad hand, and then he would list the, the various sins you have to watch out, like pork and alcohol and um, um, divination. And that was another wonderful thing, seeing the human body 
as a sort of numerical computer for a sort of moral message. Well, it's very interesting. Of course, the human body has been very important in the way we write our numbers. I mean, the, the fact that we work base 10 is really only down to the fact there's nothing special about 10. It's just the fact that we have uh, 10 fingers on our hands. I mean, uh, the Simpsons, who only have eight, presumably work base eight. Um, uh, but actually, interestingly, um, other cultures have chosen different bases. So the, the Mayans, for example, are base 20. So maybe that's hands yeah. and feet. Yeah. Um, the ancient Babylonians, of course, worked base 60, so they had numbers all the way up to 59 and then went to 60. But some have suggested that also, which of course is why we have 60 minutes in the, the hour and yeah. uh, things, angles are measured in 360s. But it also, there's some indication that that also is connected with our hand. Um, because uh, you can, if you look at your knuckles on your fingers, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And then you have five on this hand, so you can point at one lot of tell, two lot of 12. So if I do that, that's, uh, that's 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. So it seems that even base 60 might also be something to do with our anatomy. Yes. That's, that's fantastic. And of course, without saluting my audience and pleasing them too much, um, the decimal system that the world embraces comes from an Indo-Aryan root word, I think it's Gekem, isn't it? For just two hands. And I love that when one gets into sort of high science of wonderful numerology, you get straight back to the prehistoric sort of description of just two hands. And it, that prehistoric is very interesting because in some sense your book illustrates just how much uh, ever since we've been telling stories or writing, we've actually sought significance in number. I mean, it seems to be a very universal desire, the, the, the story you said of counting things. We so, seem to want to find messages in these numbers and you seem to have found a lot of different <laughs> sort of messages. But, uh, Yes, and, um, and another inspiration, which is very much following on that question, is I love the fact that numerically, visually, we're as, um, as clever as goldfinches and crows. They've done this study. You, you send up four hunters up into a box, and they can count the hunters coming out up to four to recognize you know, if it's safe to go. And visually, we, we can only do four instantly. After that, we have to start ticking off. And so four is this completely vital number and it's still alive today if you see all that ridiculous reviews about a five-star review a four-star review but it works in the paper because you can immediately guess visually the difference between four perhaps five but certainly one two three four we immediately recognize and four is one of my um, again one of the most sort of baptismal numbers of this growing obsession um, that burst out into a book was um, as well as being a, a writer which is a rather dull job you're in a dark corner typing away, very unhealthy if you're a young man. You need to do something physical, otherwise you become enraged and write bad reviews about other writers. So I, I used to work uh, in the summer on building projects, building grottos and garden temples and doing quite humble things because um, I wasn't terribly good. I'd mix the cement. But the, um, the head mason would ask me to think up things from mythology to decorate the dome. And that was an, a, a primal moment because if you're a Christian, you immediately think, of the, our four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were very closely assimilated with, with imagery. And then to find out, that's repeated by St. John, but that coincides exactly with the Jewish tradition of Azarkel. So we've got um, Azarkel speaking in his same um, human imagery, and then finding out that the Sufi tradition, the thrones of God are supported again by this eagle, by this ox, uh, by these winged figures. And so everything began to be linked together in a rather sort of harmonious, wonderful way. And then a very wise man, an Egyptologist, told me that it goes back even further than that, Barnaby. The, the, um, the, god, uh, the god Horus was protected by four deities. Sekhmet, the lion head, linking with one of our evangelists. The winged Isis and Nephthys. And you've got that same repeated imagery flowing through sort of again and again. So you think it might be partly to do with the way the human brain can't really conceive of something more than four, that four is a very, uh, you can give characters to each of those and maybe uh, when you have five, if you think when you're in prison, if you're ever in prison, you go one, two, three, four, and then it sort of gets too much, so you strike Scratch. it out. Yes. Which of course actually is um, the Mayan way they do their numbers yeah. in uh, uh, Central America. Um, they use dots, they go one, two, three, four, and again, our five they can't quite see, so they just draw a line through it. So a line is five, and so if you have 
three lines and two dots, that's 17. But maybe the, the fact that four, you can still give these characters to. Exactly. It's this intense visualization. And carrying on on that thing, I think the, the, thing, the origin of the Roman numeral V was crossing off you know, with your hand. You could express that as, but four, because of this sort of ancient respect for four, it's very natural that the Christians have four gospels. And of course, talking to an Indian audience, you do four even more than us. There are the four castes, there are the four Vedas, and then I've been told um, in one of the talks over the last couple of days, it's not just the four Vedas, there are the four layers of sacred documents themselves divided into four. And so four is, if we're exploring this adjective of power, four has got spiritual conviction. That's very interesting. I think um, uh, somebody who is quite spiritual about numbers in quite a surprising way from mathematics was Srinivasa Ramanujan. And it was very often said of him that uh, he regarded every number as his own personal friend. He had a story to tell about each number. There's a very famous story of uh, when he's in England and G.H. Hardy, the mathematician in Cambridge, who brought him to England. Uh, he was very ill in hospital and Hardy goes to the hospital um, and uh, being mathematicians, we don't really do small talk very well. Um, and he didn't know quite how to. Uh, he uh, he does, <laughs> didn't quite know how to comfort um, uh, Ramanujan. And then he, he just said, "Well, the, uh, the the number of my taxi was rather boring, uh, Ramanujan. It was 1729." And uh, Ramanujan immediately retorts, "No, hardly not a boring number at all. It is in fact the smallest number that can be written as the sum of two cubes in two different ways." So 12 cubed plus 1 cubed and 9 cubed plus 10 cubed. But it just illustrated the sort of kind of personal relationship that he had with those numbers. And I guess your time with these numbers must have built up for you a very personal relationship with, with numbers and their properties. Yes, because of this sort of, unlike you, I'm just doing a sort of game of Pelmanism, scattering them around and bringing them together. And then you get this um, realization that the, the publisher said, Barnaby, don't talk too much about ancient India and ancient Sumeria can we have 101 Dalmatians, something light now and then? And he said, you haven't, because I was terrible at all sports in my, in my boarding school, he said, you haven't investigated the spiritual properties of a football team. So I did that for about three months, and there are none. I mean, football's a very, very ancient game about taking a head or a sacrifice from one temple sanctuary to another, involving whole communities. But 11, you know, you can't make it up completely. There is, there is no 11 It just evolved out of 19th century English. Um, goalkeeping. And, and six isn't, again, avoids a very strong mystical tradition, but eight, you leap into doubling of four. And that's a sort of very male thing. The primal gods of Egypt, the Ogdod, were depicted as these eight groups of baboon, as this sort of very primal image of worshipping the sun as it rose up. And again, going back to a structure of a church or a mosque, you've got the dome of, of the one, the four squinches, the four caliphs, the Gospels, the Vedas, whatever it is, and then you tie it architecturally with eight, an octagon. So you have this, this one, four, eight, uh, reflected time and time again in different spiritual traditions. And with that eight comes a feeling of, of um, like the eight yogas, and um, going back to the chessboard, you have the eight prawns at the back. And that seems to be one of the origins about Tinker Taylor, tinker tailor, soldier sailor, rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief. It's that people used to use the chessboard to do a little divination game. And that goes back to um, the earliest print, uh, printed English book by Caxton of this description of using the prawns as an imagery. And I don't know what caste the audience is, but my mother very firmly felt that she was upper middle class. And so she had her own version of Tinker Taylor, soldier sailor. She had dashing airman, Oxford blue, um, skilled physician, qua, um, curate pale, and so that was going to be the fate of my daughter, my sister, you know, to marry into that world. Um, but, but it's got that sort of guessing but authority element to it. Well, it's interesting you also um, said that eight was a very male number, because of yeah. course in some cultures, um, actually even numbers have a very female quality, and the ancient yeah. Greeks uh, I think the ancient Chinese as well um, believed that even numbers were female and odd numbers were male and, and perhaps the primes, they were the most macho numbers of all. Um, so do, do, do you think that they, have you picked up that different cultures associate different sort of personalities with numbers? And are there universal things which cross all of these cultures that are common to a number? Well, there would be. I mean, if, if I was going to be asked for one number, if we're going to create a, a cabinet of the world, 
and give an innate respect to that number. I think it would have to be nine, because we've all toy around with trinities, and the tripling of the trinity is nine. And in practically every ancient civilization, India, Mesopotamia, Mexico, China, there's this innate um, respect for nine. And again, one of, the, one of the talks I just wandered into in, in, in Jaipur over the last four days was about the rasa and this wonderful Indian tradition of mood and color um, playing into every sort of art form. And we've got elements of that with the ancient Greek classical world where they had the muses. Um, but we've lost the subtlety of the Indian tradition over, over the last um, 800 years. But now and then you pick out tiny little bits of it because some of the, 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 the tragic um, actors uh, would have um, colors associated with their roles, which ties in quite nicely with rasa. And, and in, in nine, China is a tremendously propitious um, symbol. So an emperor on his robe would have lots of, of nine things, nine dragons or, or nine um, uh, maces of authority. And they've got this, this lovely tradition of collecting sayings together. And I don't know if I'm going to be allowed to just read, I hope, of course, yeah. Um, there are a vast number of pithy Chinese moral um, sayings collected together with nine. But these are one of my favorites, the nine virtues. Affability combined with dignity. Mildness with firmness. Bluntness with respectfulness. Ability with reverence, docility with boldness, straightforwardness with gentleness, easiness with discrimination, vigor with sincerity, valor with goodness. And then, as an opposite to play around with this, there's this lovely description of the nine jollities of a peasant to laugh, to fight, to fill the stomach, to forget to sing, to take vengeance, to disgust, to boast, and to fall asleep. And there's this sort of wonderful, almost cartoon-like imagery. And if you'll bear me with this, is the nine follies, which I think is a, still a sort of wonderful signboard for any humanist culture. To think oneself immortal, to think investments are secure. This is ancient, 3,000-year-old Chinese wisdom. To mistake conventional good manners for friendship. Beware of the English on that front. <laughs> to expect any reward for doing right. To imagine the rich regard you as an equal. That's very, very true. To continue to drink after you have begun to declare that you are sober. <laughs> That'd be relevant to tonight. And this, um, several of my friends need to be reminded of. To recite your own verse to lend money and expect its return. And something I still haven't learned to do is to travel with too much luggage. <laughs> <laughs> I think that a lot of people um, will be quite struck by the number seven, that seven does seem to come up in so many, yes. and, and you know, it is quite a large section in your book, the yep. seven deadly sins, uh, seven days of the week, um, uh, seven dwarves. Yeah. Uh, uh, so what is it about seven that, that you discovered in your uh, sort of kind of investigations? Do you, do you have a, a sense of why that is such a, a dominant number? Yes, um, seven is one of those wonderfully instinctive things that, again, after nine would be a universal number of spiritual power based, of course, on the observable stars, not the stars we know now, the observable stars that we can see with the human eye, plus the sun and the moon. And from about 200,000 years ago, mankind was aware of the stars. I mean, most of us are quite ignorant now. We live under electric lights, we watch the television. We're not so obsessed by the pattern of stars. And most children, certainly in Britain, would be hard pressed to point out the difference between a star and a planet. But of course, to our ancestors, they knew that the stars were the only things that wandered through the sky, unlike the, um, the, the planets were the only things that wandered through the sky, unlike the stars. And the other very disturbing thing about the stars is that there's a moment when they have a retrogressive action. So you're, you're watching the planet, and then it'll bobble back and then carry forward. And the other very distinctive nature of them, again, children have seemed to have lost this, is that not all the planets are ever visible at the same time of the night. So famously, we have Venus, the morning and the evening star. We have red Jupiter, 
we have Mercury, we have Jupiter and Saturn only fully visible in the, um, in, in the midnight. So everybody was aware that there were these really spooky things amongst the thousands and millions of, of spirits up there reflected as the stars. You, you had these planets, plus the sun and the moon, behaving in very odd ways, but they were watching us the whole time. And they came out and seemed to be in charge of different aspects of, of the night and the day. And you can follow that, I think, that instinctive rationalization to pinpoint why we then need to have seven archangels, why we have, you know, seven days of the week, because we're mapping that instinctive need to put things into seven. But of course, seven days of the week came quite late. Um, India had its own tradition. Ancient Egypt kept to ten for most of its civilization. The Romans, who we imagine we get seven from into Europe, not true at all. They had eight for the very good reason is that food will normally go off, certainly bread will go off, and vegetables after seven days. So they'd have an eight-day week allowing for a market day um, into it. And there are nine-day traditions as well. Seven comes from Sumeria, from Babylon, and, um, which is ancient Iraq, Mesopotamia, and the Tigris. And sevenness is deeply, deeply embedded in the whole Sumerian civilization, which is the oldest known civilization in Eurasia, with its own tradition of being founded with seven temple cities. And those temple cities themselves were founded by seven saintly figures who came from the sea. Certain Indian historians believe that they were exiles coming from the Harappa um, River Valley civilization, fleeing the pre-Indo-Aryan breakup, and that the whole pattern of world belief comes from these river valleys, from the Indus first, going through the Septemi, these, these godlike figures. I don't know if any of you ever read of, of von Daniken, who's the sort of mad version of what I'm going on, but he was very, very intrigued by these seven figures because they were believed to have to go underwater and have to return every, every, every night to be recharged by a sort of subterranean identity. And, and so seven, the seven hills of Rome, you know, if you need something imperial, you've got to have seven in it. Bombay might become an imperial city one day. It's got its own myth of being founded on seven islands because the sevenness, when you scratch around, is everywhere. I also um, heard another idea about seven, uh, as, as far as the Sumerians went, that um, the, the moon cycle, of course, is 28 days, yep. and, uh, and you can very clearly see when it's a quarter uh, and then full, then quarter back to new, so that those kind of cycles in the moon cycle, the, the quarters of the monthly period, gives you t seven again. So that, that was another... You're, you're uh, quite right. Yeah. And as you know, the other great basis of observation of the world is that um, ancient, ancient man started working out that there was this lunar cycle. And it took us quite a long time, because as you know, the moon disappears for two days took quite a long time to realize that it's actually 29 and a half days. But for most cultures, like the Sumerian, it was 30, which is another embedding into the 60 system. Right. And particularly when you do the other really basic prehistoric bit of maths, is to work out this wonderful cycle you've been notching on a stick of the lunar cycle, fitted in exactly 12 times with the 360-year solar cycle. Of course, later on we realize it's not exactly right. We've got these very, very spooky five days. And that's another thing that unites all civilizations, is the realization that these five odd days at the end of the year were totally unholy. The Romans were so obsessed by the unholiness, they wouldn't even name the two months up to this period. And most cultures, um, the Aztecs mm. and the Incas had extraordinary systems of, of blood sacrifice Absolutely. to that's appease right. this period. They had um, months which were 20 days, um, yeah. and so you, you, you had enough of those to get you up to 360, and then these five days in, in uh, um, uh, Inca and Mayan world were, were just... Were just when the spirits bad, were let unloose. Yeah. And if you go to Edinburgh for a New Year's holiday, you feel some of that power of, of everybody, even the most pious, undrinking old lady, needs to have whiskey on New Year's Day. It's sort of, you know, we change the rules, and if you go to a very grand Scottish house, you go in and give coal to the poorest neighbor. And there's this sort of wonderful element of the Lord of Misrule being entered in. And there's the Saturnalia. Things are reversed. We need to protect ourselves very largely because the rich felt it was a very dangerous time. And so on those five days in ancient civilization, you'd often put on the, the, the rags of the poor and then put the poor in your rich man's clothes in case something was going to come <laughs> down um, from the heavens. But yeah. 
The other number which uh, has come up just now is the number 12. And, and 12 is, there's so many different examples that you have of 12 in different cultures. Uh, what, what are the 12 signs of the zodiac, of course, which comes as, brings us back to the night sky? I mean, uh, uh, what, what for you do you think was the significance of 12? Is it coming from the zodiac and, and, and oh, yes. or other, other examples? Of... I, I think it's, again, this thing. There was a wonderful exhibition at the British Museum of one of the oldest mathematical computations in the world, which is this bone scored 30,000 BC, groups of five, that we think are notching off um, the lunar cycle. And um, a, a friend of mine, John Michel, who's sadly now no longer with us, really investigated this 12 tradition, he did several books about it in every direction, and he realized that everybody, um, as the prophet Muhammad knew, a lunar cycle, you don't need a priesthood. So if we start using the moon as our, as our calendar, everybody can have access to it. So it's a very easy and a very efficient way to subdivide a kingdom. So you have 12 groups who each have their lunar period to either guard the castle with the stores of grain and honey in it and oil, or to send the, the choir to sing um, praises to the, to the great mother goddess. And that embedded in many, many cultures is, is a 12-fold subdivision. And you have 12 tribe nations Famously, the 12 tribes of Israel, then you have the 12 patriarchs, you have the 12, you know, 12 sons of Adam, you have endless 12-ness everywhere. And if you're a Shiite, if there's a Shiite in the audience, you know that the 12 immediately means the 12 imams. And I've been building up another 12 to talk to Muslim audiences of the 12 women that the Prophet Muhammad loved to um, build up another reference to that. The Emperor Charlemagne, our sort of Ashoka, as it were, in Europe, was assisted by 12 magical paladin knights who come from each of the nations of Europe. And when the European Union is trying to make itself sort of attractive in a mythical the person we can way. still get hold of, that we all admire, is Charlemagne. Because he was in free negotiation with an English king doing currency reform and had this sort of 12-ness writ up um, around him. Of course, 12 for a mathematician is a, a great number because it's so divisible. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons uh, the Babylonian Sumerians went base 60 and they had the 12. I mean, we can divide it so nicely up in many different ways. And our, of course, our money before we went decimal and were influenced yeah. by the, the, the French system was, was kind of a better system because it could be divided in so many ways. And, and 10, I mean, I think Napoleon tried to change um, the hour. Uh, yes. in, he got, he used, tried to make time decimal, yes. and that's the one thing that really didn't catch on. Sort of yes, the, the French revolutionary attempt. And they'd, they had, at the time that the French revolutionary army had invaded Egypt, they bought back some of these ancient Egyptian calendars, which had also divided the world into 10. Yes. With these 10 day weeks, and they were going to cut it down so there's only one day of rest, and it would go into a sort of deist world of respect for the supreme being. Uh, but it didn't catch on. No, I saw um, a clock. Uh, I did a series about measurements uh, for the BBC, yeah. and we went and saw this clock in Paris, which had 10 hours on it, which Napoleon right, had tried, made an attempt to. I guess one thing that people get very obsessed with with numbers is uh, unlucky numbers. Yes. Um, and from 12, one goes to 13, which uh, certainly within our culture in England is an unlucky number. But uh, I don't think it's unlucky. Why, why is 13 unlucky? I mean, uh, and, and is it lucky? Uh, unlucky everywhere. It's not unlucky everywhere. I mean, it's obviously, if, if you're a Christian, you immediately think the 12 disciples, the 13th, the ordained one for sacrifice was Jesus. And also in that gathering of 12, you've got the man who's going to betray you. So um, President Roosevelt, Napoleon, would never sit down at a table. Men of power are particularly worried about the th being the 13th at the table. And I think it goes directly back to the 12 months and this stunted five-day bad month, full of blood sacrifices, full of... Um, danger, upheaval. So 13th in that tradition is, is, is bad. There are other unlucky numbers. I was hoping to find a whole sacred sort of world in China, but most of the Chinese obsession with unlucky and lucky numbers is, is a sound like. It's a sort of tonal structure. And they're very, very worried about um, four and you know, right. that yeah. aspect. Eight sounds like prosperity. And famously, when it was their turn to host Olympic Games, they made certain it was on the eighth month, on the eighth day, on the eighth hour of 2008. And everybody in China, unlike the rest of the world, could read that as a very propitious, well-organized, perfect thing. And you, in a conversation we were talking about this, 
talked about um, flying on Alitalia. Yeah, it was, it was very funny. I, I went on a flight. Uh, many uh, aeroplanes don't have a row 13 because it's considered unlucky and people won't sit there. But I was on an aeroplane and it didn't have a row 17. And I thought, this is very strange. 17 is my favorite number because it's the number I play for in my football team. Um, so I was very upset that it didn't have a row 17. So I tweeted this just before I got on. Strange, no row 17. When I landed, I had all of these followers in Italy said, that must be an Italian plane because in Italy, 17 is an unlucky number. Why? Because when you write it in Roman numerals, it's XV11. And that is an anagram of Vixi, which means I have lived, namely I am now dead. So 17 in Ita Italian culture is considered an unlucky number. So uh, very strange. And there are these, um, uh, we've heard four is bad, 14 is really bad. It sounds a bit like guaranteed death. So you avoid the 14th floor like the plague in, in um, China and Japan. But 14 to Bach, the composer, was a magical number because using that other very, very odd numerological uh, tradition where you deconstruct the alphabet on a numerical basis. So typically, you know, A get, um, gets one, B gets two, and you construct the number within, embedded in your name. And Bach found that he was 14, and then when he did his initials in his full name, he was 41, backwards. So he started embedding 14 structure into his music. And also the, um, the B-A-C-H, so he would uh, sign his, in musical form. Those would, were notes within German structure. So, yeah. Yes, so, so I mean, that's... Um, that, that comes to Gematria as well, which is the Jewish yeah. tradition of associating letters with numbers. And I think it's the source of why 666, the, the, the number of the beast, is again a, a very unlucky number. Yes, that's, it, it, it's a mad world, Gematria, because, as you know, alphabets, apart from Sanskrit, don't stand still. And so you can sort of make of this what you want, because there are traditions that get rid of the, um, the vowels in Gematria and just the consonants or add them in both. But there's a famous um, section in the Gospel, um, the Revelations of St. John, um, identifying um, the mark of the beast is six, six, and you'll have 666 on it. And people have deconstructed that as identifying Nero Caesar um, in the, the whole um, succession of the six emperors who were responsible for the first persecution of the Jews and the Romans and bringing imagery into the temples. It was his way, writing in a Roman world, of embedding a curse into it. And those, um, in, in, in the, um, the rhyming couplets you often see before a Persian-built mosque or palace, uh, uh, both in the Deccan or in Persia, you'll often find in the couplet will be an embedded date structure of when the building was commissioned and opened by the Sultan. And that goes way back. The, the Islamic and the Jewish culture love this, but we traced it back to an Assyrian dedication inscription of about 800 BC. So it's, a, it's an ancient, ancient form that, like many things, you know, you know much better than this, about the arrival of the zero. It took a long time to get from India to England. I think it took several thousand years or whatever, not to the 17th certainly century. Yeah. But it was certainly about the time of Bach in the 17th century when the English and the French got obsessed by Gematria and this sort of hidden code, and Mozart played around with it with a magic flute. But basically, without rubbishing, it's all a complete lot of nonsense. Exactly. A, well, um, especially I, I wrote, wrote a little bit about in the number mysteries about the Gematria as yeah. well, and uh, so I was quite intrigued what my name. So <laughs> I trans so I, my, my number is 326. When you uh, but but when I looked this up, what what other words? Um, it might represent. So one was man of fame, which I quite liked, um, yeah. but I could also interpret it as asses, so um, donkeys. So I, 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 um, I think I, the whole thing is a load of rubbish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, perhaps we'll open up to the floor and, and get some questions because I'm quite intrigued to, we've got some I'm just microphones. Gonna, I'm just yeah. gonna ask one question so I don't show my complete ignorance to this audience, is when I'm in, in the West, you know, they say, you know, what's, your, what's your most exciting number recently? And of course, it tied in with that wonderful lecture we, we all heard, or many of us heard, about Hampi, is this 108, how 108 reappears both in Indian, ancient Indian civilizations, but also in China, Japan, the Far East. The whole Asian world is obsessed by this 108. Genghis Khan, when he designed his imperial tent city in Central Asia, made certain there were 108 towers to protect the city. Just like Jaipur, it's got eight great gates. We've heard about the eight maleness. It's got nine quarters. We've heard about the nine, uh, the wealth prosperity reflected with nine. 108 is this wonderful recurring feature. In Japan, at the end of the year, they ring out 108 strikes the bells in their temple shrines, and people try and remember 108 things they've done badly, 
and 108 things that they've done good and try and prepare themselves for the next year. The Zen priests have great um, trails of 108 beads and it, it's infected everywhere and those that, that um, 108 uh, carvings we saw um, at, at Hampi are all part of that tradition. And of course you know better than I that 108 was sort of manufactured from the sacred mystery of the Sanskrit language of 54 letters being used in their male and female forms to praise and describe um, the gods. All the gods had this wonderful litany of praise. The one that's best known in the West certainly is the hymns to Lord Krishna and you can still get those 108 epithets of praise. And to a certain extent I think the um, Zoroastrians borrowed that from India, 101 uh, um, words of praise for a Huru Mazda and perhaps the Muslims Maybe it's a contentious, played around it with the 99 descriptions of the qualities of the prophet and, and of the powers and the beauties of God. So you've got this 108-ness impregnated everywhere. That's and a sort of, very intriguing number, isn't it? It's a very intriguing number. I mean, uh... and, and it's also got the symbolism of one, existence, zero, nothingness, eight, sometimes done on its sign of, of an endless recurring cycle of prosperity. So in the word 108, or the visualization of it, you've got one nothingness infinite. So you've got a sort of a mystic chant, right. which might also, and this is when my editor got rather annoyed with me, he said, Barnaby, not everything can go back to the Indus Valley, but here 108 seems to go back directly back to the measurement system of eight grains of barley, which are considered to be a finger width. And that multiplied up creates our first intimate touch with 108, which then gets linked with, by some Indians, not all, with the sacrifice of Shakti, trying to stop the dance of uh, destruction of Lord Shiva and cutting ourselves up into these morsels of self-sacrifice as the goddess um, dropping down onto India. So it's got tremendous sort of unreconcilable but fascinating sort of qualities. Yeah, wonderful. But we should... Let's um, uh, give a chance for some questions or uh, your favorite unlucky numbers or whatever. So um, let's start with this lady here um, on the end. And uh, put your hands out so we can prepare. Uh, and this lady on the end here. We'll go. So. Thank you, sir. It was a very interesting presentation. Uh, we have discussed the whole numbers. I wanted to know the author's take on the magical proportions, as we call them. I am particularly uh, wanting to know your take on the magical proportion of beauty, as they call. That is the Greek number phi which signifies 1.67. They say when they took Cleopatra's facial measurements and the ratio of the width and the length came out to be 1.67. And this holds for almost all the renowned beauties in the world. So I wanted to know your take on that magical proportion of beauty. It's very interesting because this is a question that uh, I, I had had in my mind to ask Barnaby, which is you know, the idea that all, all the numbers that you talk about are whole numbers yes. inside here. And of course, there are, are fractions and proportions and um, irrational numbers, um, which are ones that can't be written in proportions, with, like the golden ratio. And in, intriguingly, um, of course, uh, your yes. book uh, probably, <laughs> um, it, it, it's on the front cover of the book um, is this thing called the Fibonacci spiral. So it's made out of the Fibonacci numbers, whole numbers, but these whole numbers, if you take the ratios of them, tend more and more to this uh, thing, the golden ratio, which is considered um, the perfect proportions in art, nature, beauty. Um, so uh, why did you only go for whole numbers? Are, are whole numbers... Uh... I, I wanted to remain like a goldfinch and um, be very... keep my... I think if you're going to write, you can't invent enthusiasms. And so you just have to go with what empowered me, which are these sort of adjective, number being used as a sort of adjective of, of, of convincement. I think with your work, shortly, these numbers will have a resonance to a wider audience. And you could start using these fractions. But do you know any fraction, or, or, or you, madam, that has got an emotion that would mean something to a world culture yet? Well, I, I think um, uh, the, uh, the lady here has picked on one which does, and, and it is, you know, why is there something universal about um, this ratio, which is, uh, you know, it's a very, I mean, you've given an approximation of it. It's actually, uh, I mean, I, I, it's so cold here. I have such a lovely range of T-shirts, um, but underneath here is a T-shirt with a, <laughs> uh, uh, another irrational number. So, so this is um, pi, uh, three point words. So, so this is a number which goes on to infinity, and... Um, the, the golden ratio is also one which actually you can't express. It's something which 
um, you can never capture it. You try to express it in a finite way, but I mean, it's the square root of five plus one divided by two. But there is something intriguing. Why do we, so many different cultures have been drawn to this ratio as something um, that is considered as something with a, 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 a certain beauty about it? And I think um, to, to, to answer from my sort yeah. of world, um, I think it is because partly of this little picture which is on the front, which is about growth. So we see um, very naturally why this proportion starts to emerge if one grows things out of very simple numbers. And the way that nature um, grows a flower or a shell, uh, for example, the things that we see around us um, uh, in the natural world uh, very often have this proportion in it. And then we start to express it in art. And it's interesting, Leonardo da Vinci, of course, uh, looked a lot at the human face and about um, proportions um, in the body and the face which were connected with the golden ratio. Um, but I did uh, some work in, in Japan just recently, and, and they actually favor something called the silver ratio. And silver ratio is a much longer sort of rectangle. The golden ratio, actually, uh, your credit card is in the golden ratio. It's sort of a perfect rectangle. But they quite like things which are slightly elongated. So this silver ratio actually is probably one that aesthetically is more appealing to the Japanese. And is there a different Japanese credit card on that? <laughs> no, I think they use ours, actually. It's um, let's, oh, yes, yes. You want to? No, I mean, I, I just feel terribly sorry for those priests who worked out, you know, having observed the moon, that actually the whole world wasn't harmonious after all. The 30 didn't fit with the 360. The 30 wasn't even 30, it was 20.5, you know, 20 and that's, that's a, you know, a grounding down. It's a very imperfect world, and it, it, it's the grit that adds the pearl to you know, Absolutely. so much of these structures. E even musical harmony, actually, um, comes down to the fact that we divide um, an octave into 12 notes, but it isn't quite exactly yes, 12 of cycles of a fifth, and that, that kind of little grit as well is, of course, what uh, the whole problem of uh, tuning a piano so that you have equal temperament. Um, but it's, it's the grit which makes maths and life, I think, and exciting. And it's a book full of grit. I must remind you, if you're interested in maths, don't buy a copy. Oh, I, um. I disagree, actually. <laughs> I, I disagree, because I think that it does illustrate how number and mathematics... Uh, I mean, you know, these are numbers which have meaning for people, yeah. and, and this, that's sort of what I'm finding, yes. what motivates me. I'm trying to find meaning, but a different sort of meaning. And we talked about that, that the other thing, which I find very, very sweet, which might tie in with the 99 names of God, is you talked about it, the structure. One of the first ways of counting was up to 33, using the fingers and all the joints, and coming up to your genitals as the 33rd. And that ties in with the life of Christ, the number of vertebrae in your backbone, the orders of Freemasons, it's all muddled up together. Yeah. And in the same way that the ancient world thought that 33 and 40 and 42 could be similar, because there are different ways of using the body to make a sort of a mud or a tattoo notching. I mean, it's all, yeah. it's all a mass of inaccuracy, which t thrills me. <laughs> oh. um, let's have the question from over here. Yeah. First, a very quick comment. I believe there's a gentleman called Cecil Ballman, who with the Mittal group uh, constructed a, a design for the Olympics, the last Olympics in the UK, using all ratios of, uh, basically, ratios and fractals. Uh, but my question really is, I, I gather there is a school of science that now has established uh, that every single design and shape in nature is, can be a variation of a code or a, a computer formula. And there's some thinking on that. Have you heard of it? Is it, is it non-science or science? So I think if I understand your question, it was about um, that there are formulas essentially to generate any um, particular shape that appears in nature. And uh, of course, that's my goal, is that mathematics will have a formula for everything, for, for love and uh, consciousness. And, um, uh, but I, I think that um, you know, we do, uh, I mean, it's interesting that a lot of um, uh, human construction, of course, goes first of all to looking at um, what nature has done and, and tapping into that. I mean, there's a, an amazing uh, stadium, which was an Olympic stadium in uh, Munich, which was based on the way that bubbles form. And bubbles form very efficient and stable structures. And so it's, it has a very light feel to it, and yet it's incredibly strong. So, so I think that um, you know, a lot of architects tap into what they see in the natural world in, in order to create something which resonates for us because we, we tend to like seeing things which um, uh, resonate with nature, but um, uh, and, and often nature 
it's very good at finding the, the sort of efficient solutions, which are often mathematical. Mathematics, are, uh, I think, is a lot is about finding um, the sort of uh, uh, low energy solution. The, the sphere, why is a bubble a sphere? Um, because uh, it's, that's the shape containing that volume which has the smallest surface area. And that surface area is the amount of energy that's being used. So it's the least energy um, state. And that's yeah. why the bubble assumes that. I think that's a good answer of the question I couldn't answer. <laughs> um, let's uh, take a, another question. Uh, this gentleman here, please, and uh, put some hand, and we'll have the, uh, the boy down here. Thank you. Considering that uh, all numbers have got some sacred significance in almost, in one culture or another, would you then agree that, you know, numerus originally means name? Uh, essentially, it means that every number being a symbol can be given a sacred significance. I mean, we may privilege some over others, but in fact, each number is an expression of power. And just a, a brief statement on what you said about Napoleon and uh, decade. Actually, this was well before Napoleon. It was even before the revolution. It was the Illuminist thought of the Freemasons, the Egyptian order, and the attempt to go back to Pythagoreanism. And it was a French poet, Fabre de Glantine, who devised this revolutionary calendar, which Napoleon promptly abolished. Thank you. Great, well, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, but I think Napoleon was also obsessed with 10 as well. Uh, but, um, so, I, I, yes, the question, I, I think, is a, a good one, you, you know, that, um, uh, that perhaps we you know, there are so many uh, significances in numbers being found, and, and you know, you go, um, you start, well, actually, you, interestingly, you go from big numbers down to zero. Yes. I mean, an uh, interesting <laughs> choice of that direction of numbers, but certainly the first... Um, I don't know, 50 numbers that we can find so many different meanings that, that doesn't really have any meaning at all by the time that, uh, um, it, 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 does any of this have any significance because every single number seems to have something, uh, some little story to it in your book. But. You're quite right. I mean, th th there is no point to it, but it's amazing how often people have to do it. They've just refined the English class system to seven. It fits in immediately into a pattern of thought and of, you know, the, um, the pack of cards for a long time was used as, as a way of looking at the four castes and the four divisions of society, the four humours. And we all know that, well, most of us know that astrology is a dodgy science, but we're all addicted to it. It's absolutely fascinating. And you, you get engaged in things that aren't fully rational and motivate, you know, re religious motivation, all of these things are summed up and are still with us. And I think by looking at the power of numbers and seeing what's false and what's correct or what's just fun, and what's part of our ancient heritage going back 200,000 years. I'm certainly in favor of keeping every aspect of our ancient heritage, everything, every language, every belief system, every statue, every temple. You don't have to believe emphatically how they believed, but to, to enjoy that richness of the whole massive human experience is, for me, a tremendous continuous dance with time. And you know, the playing cards, it's got that spooky element. You've got, you've got the, the casts, we know it came from China via India, Mameluk Egypt, passed on by the Venetians to France and England, yet again, Western Europe, right at the end of the intellectual food chain. Change the symbolism, but then when you start adding up the, the 10 and call the, the jack or the knave 11, the queen and the king, numerate them up, you get 364 for the days of the year. And then you have the joker as the 365th, and you have this sort of chilling predestination, tied in with the history that the ace became the top during the French Revolution. And for me, you, know, you can tell the history of the world in a pack of cards. It's nonsense, you know, um, like the tarot. But at the same time, it's this wonderful structure of how we have believed and still believe. And um, it, it, when the biographers were talking, they were talking, it's no good being wise now in the 21st century. You've got to remember that most people thought the four humors tied in with the four compass directions um, and the energy of earth, air, sanguinous, was of an absolute vital concern for their doctors and for their poets. And so you've got to know this stuff. You don't have to know it all, but you've got to be aware of its uh, resonance, I feel. Yes, I, I think that's uh, Richard Holmes in his uh, discussion yeah. about biography, um, impressed on the fact that as a biographer, you need to know, well, in, in the period that he was looking at uh, pre-Victorian, that yeah. we, we still believe that um, the four elements were earth, wind, fire, and water. And so yeah. it, it, it really helps us to read history, to know um, this kind of, uh, these kind of numbers. And, and then you know, thinking about the four, the four golden ages we know is part of that system of four strength, but then the Marxists defined the world into four versions of the golden age. 
and that's you know one of the systems of thought that nearly uh, destroyed our civilizations on one level and so you have to you know you, you need to arm yourself with what numbers can emotionally bring with them well this is good armor if any there was so um, let's have uh, a question from the uh, uh, boy at the front here uh, hello sir so I would like as I wanted to ask you sir in your book so there are many numbers which you've not written about like after 64 you've directly come to 60 so these num and then uh, so these numbers which you've skipped like are these numbers of no importance so that's the first thing and so secondly I wanted to share something with you so because we were talking about those unlucky numbers so I remember so I come from Chandigarh so we have sectors there and so we don't have sector 13 in our case like after 12, we directly have sector 4. So 13 is an unlucky, so you skipped. Uh, um, so, so interesting question. Uh, there, are, yes. there are a lot of numbers missing from here. I mean, infinitely many numbers, of course. Uh, um, is that uh, uh, a series then? Uh, volume no. 2 will be... The, so the why, why are there numbers missing? Sort of, I mean, you have the early numbers. It's, it's a very good question. Yeah. And um, it all comes down... I'm a publisher as well. And I, I, I didn't publish this book in order to make it better. Sort of a, a kosher book. I went to another publisher to see if he wanted to, to do it. And um, I'm afraid the book got very, very fat. And so he got rid of about half of it. And um, not, it doesn't really defend it because there are still missing numbers. But I was so cross about it. And one of the wonderful inventions of the modern world is your own website. So I posted up all the numbers that he's cut out. And then um, quite often after a talk like this, people come up, Barnaby, you've missed out the real importance of 53. And I'm terribly excited. Um, and there was, for instance, there's the um, 23, is, is, a, uh, is a new thing. There's a whole series of beat poets from the 60s who were inspired by this magical coincidence of this very depraved, drug-taking poet in Morocco who was sitting down at a cafe one morning and someone was describing um, that he'd had um, 23 successful journeys as a captain. And he thought, oh, that's wonderful, it was Captain Clark. And then later that day, he heard the radio that Captain Clark on his 23rd mission had had a crash. And then that very same day, he heard about another Captain Clark in Florida, who also on his 23rd mission had, had an accident. And then, and then this drug-crazed poet, rather brilliant man, then started collecting 23. And this has inspired a whole lot of mad rock, rock musicians who want to get into the oddness of 23, which has never been a sacred or interesting number, but since the beat poets have got up, have created their own little mythology around it. And if you've got any ideas, email me, and then I can credit them on my website of missing numbers of sacred and mythical importance. Excellent. Uh, so David Beckham should not have chosen 23 to go and play for in Real Madrid. Maybe it was a... <laughs> if you'd read that, he might, he might not have. Uh, um, OK, let's have a, uh, another question. Uh, the gentleman in the white uh, jacket's here. Um, and then if we can have a hand raised here. Um, uh, let's have the woman at the front, please. Uh, my question is, you didn't talk about th uh, the number three. The three is very important for us. It's about uh, the Trinity. It's about the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And it's about uh, Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwar. It's about the three gunas, which is uh, Satvik, Tamasik, Radhasik, and so on. Uh, I hope three is covered in your uh, book. And the uh, next question is about prime numbers. Uh, prime numbers have got some mystical quality about them. And does, do you have a section on that? Say again, what was the, it's the, prime the prime numbers as such? They have a mystical quality and their relationship with Kabiru security is well known. But is there a section on prime numbers as separately? Okay. Thank you. Um, so, the importance of the number three, we, I mean, uh, there are so many stories to tell, yeah. and we chose a few numbers as a. Um, but of course, yeah. three is important in many cultures and, and is as documented in your book. Three but. is fantastically important, fertile number, and it goes back to the goddess. Again, every agrarian civilization knew that planting a corn into the earth, um, men associated with semen, with watering, but the earth and fecundity was always three, because we know all civilizations that would address this great goddess in three forms, as the virgin unploughed um, by sex or by corn, as the fertile mother, and, and the vengeful goddess of destruction. And of course, in the Hindu tradition, we know that that goddess, Shakti, has got many, many names, but she's often depicted as a trinity in herself. And you find threeness everywhere. And it, you know, the Muslims you know, can rubbish Christianity as, as a, a half-formed paganism, because we're still embedded in, in trinity obsessions and the, um, 
all the uh, pre-Christian Gallo-British tribes were mad about these mother goddesses, which were often shrouded, you didn't even see their face, the matrimonii, in groups of nine or three. Um, if you go to the hill forts of England, you'll find little chapels still to the maiden, um, the unwed one. And threeness is everywhere and gets picked up. There's a great chunk of threeness there awaiting your delight. Absolutely. And, um, uh, and prime numbers, I guess, I would steer you to one of my books. <laughs> I mean, yes. there, there's nothing... I mean, you don't mention primes, I think, explicitly nope. here, but nope. um, certainly uh, there's a book, The Music of the Primes, which I try and tell the whole story of our obsession with, with prime numbers. Now, I think, unfortunately, we've uh, come to the, the end yes. of our time, yep. but, I, but I, I suppose, actually, you, uh, in your book, you do record what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything, and, and of course, uh, the number is 42. 42. So I think on that note, we'll uh, end our session. That's your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob.